Hello and welcome to the Critic Curious. We are in Crusader Kings 3 right now and we are going to be doing kind of a tips and tricks for a beginner's guide to this game. Now bear with me guys because this is an absolute monstrous huge game. Now it recently just released onto console so there's a lot of PlayStation and Xbox players kind of trying to get into this game right now. Um, I did play this a little bit on the PC and I've been playing an awful lot on on console since release so I'm going to try and do uh, my guide what I kind of think is worth knowing uh, when you very first start off this game and hopefully you guys find it entertaining and useful now usually when it comes to tips and tricks of videos I do very snappy videos very you know uh, to the point but this game is a little bit trickier to do that sort of thing with so I'm going to start a playthrough we're going to start as not someone not insignificant. We're going to start off as King Charles II. Uh, he owns France. So we're going to have a few different options of different things that we can talk about uh, from here. Now, the first thing that you probably want to do um, is look at who you actually get. Now, there are definitely um, people that you can pick, you know, who the game recommends you pick. But honestly, there's a lot of players, uh, a lot of people that you can pick from in this game. So have a look around and pick someone that you want to play as. Um, I think that's really important. Actually, I think the first tip to really do is when you actually start your game um, from this pause menu right here. Think about what it is you want to do in your lifetime, because this game is so big that you cannot do everything like you may want to conquer the entire world. And maybe you can do that, but you're not going to do it in this lifetime. If we look at King Charles, he is 43 years old. And remember, this is, you know, medieval times. So he's not going to live to 100. I mean, you can stretch it and you can choose it. And I'm going to show you how to do that. But, you know, he has a limited life. Um, so you really should think about what it is you want to be doing with this life, looking at the future next generation as well. So if we have a little look-see at King Charles, see what he's got, see who he is and what he's about. So he already has a primary heir, which is pretty cool because that is our son. So that works out pretty cool. Usually when it comes to feudal governments, it will go down to the next player heir being, you know, a direct descendant from you. However, um, much like everything else in this game, it's not as easy as that. And if you end up having another son, for instance, when you die, the things are going to pass over to, to them as well. So we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But first thing we will need to, need to do at the pause menu before we even go is look at if we need to marry anyone off and, of course, you know, continue our dynasty with children. Um, so right now we have a son who isn't married. It would be a very good idea to... Um, wed him off because of course if he has more children then that means that we can continue our dynasty and at the beginning of the game uh, you know there's a lot of availability if you wait a second then everyone's going to kind of snap up the good ones we're going to have a little look see at uh, find a spouse if we go to arrange marriage that will look at our court um, our immediate court and people within our kingdom if you go to find spouse that will look elsewhere generally creating an alliance um, and we can actually channel who and what we're looking for if we want more prestige or if we want more alliance power we can have a look and um, change the type of people it's kind of offering to us i tend to leave it on you know what it is by default but we are looking to strengthen our alliance there's a few different things you can look at you can look at you know, getting a decent alliance. So let's say, for instance, you want to, I wanted to ally with England, you know, going into actually specifically going over to, for instance, Wessex and seeing if they have any available people that we might be able to get an alliance with is a very good option as well. But it's definitely about all thinking about that future um, and what that kind of has with it. And the same with when you go to marriage, you're going to be looking at their traits as well. Because, for instance, if we was to marry uh, this 
rather available young woman here uh, you know her traits will carry over to our kids as well her her traits and her abilities um it kind of this is what we're you know our kids are are looking for now this one doesn't actually have any inheritable tra traits but her stats do carry over to to our children potentially uh, so if we have a little look see our son once again and of course wed him off and get that sorted Oh, we have an inheritable, tool, inheritable trait because we're going to be slightly inbred if uh, if we marry this one. So maybe look at someone else. Finding people you're related to uh, in this game is very common. And again, oh, hold on. Let's have a little look-see. What is this trait we are carrying over? It's stuttering. Yeah, our son has a little bit of an issue. So that's um, an inheritable trait. That's a bad one, unfortunately does come with debuffs to the characters there we go not related to this one though and as you can see unfortunately you know uh, her father dynasty is a little bit less inferior to us but they are still an ally anyway and um, we do also have if we go back there we go we do also have a daughter so we have one daughter that's already married but we have another daughter who is of age of marriage i think when you become 16 you become the age of marriage so as you can see she does not have a spouse so finding a spouse for her is going to be important now typically unless you have changed the rules um females in a game they don't necessarily inherit titles you can change it and they do inherit titles but it will prefer to give it to a male heir um so What's very important when it comes to finding a marriage to, you know, with your daughters, for instance, is make it a matrimonial marriage. That way, any lands and titles that they happen to be inheriting uh, will actually go over back to your dynasty rather than their dynasty. Another important thing to note I didn't mention with the son is when you're looking for your potential spouse, the younger, the better. Obviously, because they're going to be more fertile, we're going to have more time to potentially have children. Now, on females in this game, they seem to be capped at around 40. So if you are looking for um, a marriage partner, someone in their late 30s, probably not going to produce any children for you, unfortunately. When it comes to men, they don't seem to have a drop off at all. So, for instance, we could marry this 56 year old and have a good chance of still having children. Um so we have a medium chance of still having children and we get some good prestige out of it as well. So we will do that. Now, another thing to talk about is ourselves. Now, we're already married. Now, as we said about that, you know, 40 is kind of the cutoff for, for pregnancy. As we can see, our queen, well, she's already past 40. So you've got a decision to make if you're going to take this character. Now, you can actually just imprison her, chop her head off and remarry <laughs> if you want but we already have children so in this playthrough we don't necessarily do that but keep that in mind because you know when it comes to this game it isn't about now it's about tomorrow and you want more family members for the bigger dynasty but there is a caveat to that and we're going to talk about that a little bit later when it comes to inheritance okay so we talked about uh ourselves and we've we've married off our kids which is great so when we unpause this game we're going to have a few alliances which is which is brilliant that's what we want uh so now let's talk about let's talk about military military would be a good point to kind of talk about now when it comes to military at the beginning of the game um, there's going to be a few things that are going to be of note so levies come from the land that you actually own the more land you have the bigger your levies however levies are basically peasants picking up pitchforks they're not going to be fighting particularly well and they do die very very quickly uh, so if you go up against a army with a lot of men at arms you're probably going to die even if you have a lot more people when it comes to um knights there's a few different things to work on here these are powerful warriors that can definitely tip the scale of combat um so it's worth trying to have seven out of seven or the maximum that you are allowed men at arms are your best 
kind of troops. So these are the guys that are actually trained to be part of your army that will do most of the work. Um, and you can have different amounts of regiments. And it says I've got zero out of four with a few different perks and things like that. Um, we can put that up you know, beyond four, but for right now, we're capped at four. Um, for the most part, light footmen are the best bang for your buck, really. In this case, being a feudal government, it's going to cost us gold to create it. It's definitely worth creating, as you see, once we've created it, we've got five out of 100 there ready to use right now. Now, as time progresses, we will recruit more troops, so don't worry about that. Um, it will kind of produce and train those troops as time goes on. So you just need to be time to be moving forward for that to happen. And if you look, it's important to note when it comes to bowmen, if we look right here, you can see the bowmen counters skirmishes. Um, so it's a good idea to look at what counters what, because if we look at light footmen, you can see that their type is a skirmisher. So having a decent amount of bowmen Early game, again, is a good option. And of course, if you are going to be doing a lot of raiding, definitely have a look at actually investing in siege mechanics because having siege mechanics in this game are going to seriously quicken the length of time it takes you to take a castle. And if you are in Europe like we are right now, then a lot of this area is very, you know, built up, already have established castles, hard to raid. You're going to lose a lot of levies trying to raid um, a castle without siege weapons. So have a think about that too. Also, a good idea is to make sure your council is fully stocked. Looking at your council, these guys are basically um, people that are already part of your court. They may be vessels underneath you. As you can see, we've got our wife here right now too. And they all do different things that are really important, but not having, like just having empty slots is going to suck for your, for your kind of uh, country and management of your country and your realm. Now, to make sure that you don't lose people unintendedly, it's a good idea that when you're looking at your army and looking at your knights, to actually look through and see who, are, who you are allowing to be your knight. Now, as you can see, we've got our cousin right here, who is a vessel and a knight. We also have, let's see, there we go, our steward. So our steward is allowed to be a knight right now. Um, Meaning that if we go into battle, there's a good chance that he could die. So you have the option to forbid him to go into battle. Another good thing to think about, when we spoke of earlier about our heirs. So we have two sons currently. So if we were to die right this second, guys, there's a very good chance that our kingdom's going to get split up equally between both of our male heirs. So what we could do is go down, find our son. There he is and force him to be a knight. Now, in forcing him to be a knight, as you can see, he only has one prowess, meaning he's not going to be a very good knight, meaning there's a very good chance he's going to die um, and therefore be disinherited. Kind of solves the problem before it you know, comes near. Now, in my opinion, especially early game, um, having more daughters than sons is a good idea because the daughters are going to constantly you know pump out more babies which increases your dynasty you can marry them off for alliances there's all kind of benefits like that male heirs unfortunately unless you um kind of progress through the game and are able to change your line of secession and that's going to take a long time it's going to take you quite a lot of this game in order for you to do that um but to change that it's going to be late game so early game, you're going to be look, looking for a single heir. Make sure you know who that heir is, kind of prep it so, so that's the guy that's going to take over your kingdom and your kingdom doesn't get split up that way. So we covered council. Um, also, the queen, we didn't cover the queen. The queen, real quick, can support any scheme. So for instance, if you, like this guy right here, has incredibly low martial skill, I could change the queen as role to support the you know the, the the marshal and get those things done but alternatively i would just replace him for someone who's a little bit better suited for the job like for instance my vessel knight right here who has a 23 
23 martial skill and therefore he's going to be a lot better idea to do this however the guy that we're going to be you know kind of sacking they're not going to be happy with you so uh, it's probably a good idea to make sure that you kind of nurse his ego maybe even start a scheme to befriend him a little bit that way he's happy being um, not on the council so we talked about that let's have a little look see we've looked at the council and the decisions the decisions are kind of where you need to be looking right at the start of the game this is going to be a long term game so founded on an empire gives you a goal for what you're going to be doing hopefully in this life cycle you know cycle for our king we're already a kingdom so we don't need to found a kingdom we've got a kingdom um, you're going to be looking at founding an empire and it will tell you what your requirements need to be so for instance we need extra fame basically means you know conquering more countries uh, we also need to hold free kingdoms so again conquering more countries enabling us to to do that and eventually we'll be able to found ourselves an empire so that kind of gives you a long-term aim when it comes to the little decisions these ones right here if you don't have maximum knights or if you want better knights calling them is a good idea claimants are great because without claimants you can't invade um other other countries and you can't increase your kingdom probably one of the first things you want to do again before you even unpause the game is search for a physician because if you get injured or if one of your family members gets injured you're going to need someone with medical knowledge to to help um you know save that person's life so searching for a physician at the beginning of the game is very important there's a lot of disease at the beginning of the game you wouldn't want let's say you only have one heir you wouldn't want them to get a disease and then you not to have a physician to help save their life on top of that being on console we have this hints at the bottom of the screen we just have to hit the right analog stick and that will pop it all up and if we go to suggestions it will tell us what it thinks we should do now nine times out of ten this is very very accurate and shows you exactly what can be done within your kingdom right now um, and possibly what should be done now when it comes to creating titles that's a different video altogether so i'm going to avoid that for right now probably not something you want to be doing when you very first start the game anyway but for instance making alliances uh, making alliances is a great idea seeing who you can ally with in our case we've got a few decent alliances right off the bat which is great so let's just make these alliances as you can see they all want to make the alliance we could possibly use a hook as well and to kind of get them in if we had a hook on them or needed one but there we go uh, it also tells us that we have children without guardians making sure our kids have guardians is really important because you can teach them extra things they can inherit different traits and skills based on who their guardian actually is and of course it's showing us we have four members of our family that need to be married off we've kind of done our son and heir and we've done our other son have we done our daughter i think we've got this daughter to do as well make sure that's a matrimonious marriage and we'll take the first one nicely done and we did do this one okie dokie so that covers kind of hints and stuff like that again we are still not ready to uh to kind of hit that unpause button now we've been on pause for almost 20 minutes now but we've still been doing stuff in our kingdom setting up our first moves when we hit that unpause a lot of stuff's going to happen because we've been you know we've been tinkering away making sure that our kingdom is going to be here to stay so the first thing we want to do oh the next thing we want to do because we've done a lot of first things is look at our lifestyle um, lifestyle is very important this kind of uh, talks about all the perks and stuff that we're going to be unlocking as we play the game we're going to be earning experience to um, to earn these perks and of course make our game a little bit easier now I know it's very very easy to think oh, okay I'm going to play this game I want to play as a marshal or I want to play as a diplomat and I'm not saying don't dip into anything that you want to do or play the game that you you know 
don't play it the way you don't want to play it but every character is unique and some characters are better suited to other things for instance our character happens to be uh, an 30 percent more experience if we choose the learning so going the way that kind of the game suggests to you is definitely um probably the right way to go now, if we look in learning, personally, learning for me is the best one, especially as we're playing as an old character right now, trying to extend his life is a great idea. So I would pick medical focus. Medical focus gives us a small health boost. And if we go into a uh, whole of body, if we go to wash hands, just learning to wash our hands is great. We're going to have a, you know, a significantly less chance of getting illness. And again, if we go to Iron Constitution, we also get 30% more fertile and we also get a massive health boost. And again, go to healthy, again, medium health boost. All of this extends your life. With these perks, I've actually managed to get characters to live to 96, which in this game is quite impressive. Um, so investing in this in an old character is probably a good option. I'm actually going to make a video which talks about the best perks in a game and a way to do go because you don't have to just stay um, on wherever you pick the entire game. You can every five years change it if you want to. And there was something else I wanted to talk about real quick. Dynasty isn't something you kind of need to talk about early game, but culture probably is. Now, as I am head of culture, I have access to where we look at in civics. Um, now, as you play the game, as you progress through your game, you're going to be naturally popping off points towards city planning, for instance. Passively, it's going to take 391 years, but if I wanted that to be quicker, um, I could just click on city planning and now it's only going to take 20 years but the point is this game is all about the future looking at tomorrow what i want to be doing um this one can give me shines and player halls trading outposts and stuff like that or if i wanted to go for barracks there we go if i wanted to go for barracks um just look at where you want to go. I personally think that Muster Grounds is probably the most important one for me right now because I'm going to be doing a lot of expansion and I would have uh, Mana Arms Regiments plus two. So instead of only having four Mana Arms, I can have six Mana Arms, um, which is pretty cool. Ah, oh, sorry, that's the size. So instead of having level four, I could go up to level six. And also maximum number of mana arms would increase to one. So from four to five. I read that wrong. But as you can see, actually focusing on it uh, will give me significantly less time to wait around for that to passively go. And of course, that, you know, being a master of your culture is very important later game in order to be able to change um, titles of succession and stuff like that. Okay, so we're finally ready to unpause the game. And when we do, as you can see, we start getting all of these alliances that have been formed because of all of the marriages that we've kind of sorted out, which is brilliant. Any more? There we go. We had another one pop up as well. So yeah, so now we've just started the game and we've got a load of alliances, which is really helpful. Um, of course, keep an eye on your suggestions bar. And as you can see right here, it says negotiate alliances too. Um, so make sure you do this. It's kind of just make sure that these guys actually um, come in and, and help you when you go to war. And there was actually one more thing that I wanted to... Oh, if this stuff stops popping up, that would be great. There we go. All these alliances are done now and cemented. So let's pause the game really quickly. And if you look up here, you can see it mentions holdings, you know, how many holdings we currently have. And it says 10 over six. We actually have four holdings more than we should have. Um, so a good thing to kind of look at is to give your land to certain people because if you don't, you can very quickly find that you're actually getting a negative debuff for having 
too many holdings, too many things for you as your kingdom to be looking out for. Personally, what I like to do is actually make my sons and heirs vessels. So for instance, this is the guy that I want to be kind of carrying over to when, when I die. So it would be a good idea to give him those, those kind of titles. One, he becomes a vessel under you anyway. He's going to be uh, the person inheriting um, stuff from you. So you know, it all kind of stays within the family that way. And we can only give three right now, unfortunately. Um, so we're still going to be one over, but it doesn't hurt us. You know, there's no debuff there anyway, but it's something to watch out for because if you do have a tremendous amount more than, than you should, you will start getting those debuffs. Not only do you get those debuffs, but your other vessels resent you for having so much land. So it's a good idea to get rid of the counties, maybe even the duchies, um, depending on your title rank, the counties, duchies, kingdoms, empires in that order. Um, if I was to give him a kingdom, you'll notice that he'll actually become independent from me. Because if I give him the a king title, because I am only king, kind of makes him my equal. So that's something to kind of look out for when you're giving these titles away. Luckily, the game does tell you that this is going to happen as well. So have a little read, make sure you're giving away the right things. It's also a really good idea to make sure you're giving um, away titles kind of, you know, to someone within the same region, the last thing you want is for, for instance, you know, six people to be owning six different counties in the same country. That's that's going to create havoc later um, and everyone's going to resent each other as well. So, yeah, anyway, let's grant some titles. As you see, uh, he's now got them that reduced the amount that we have. And, oh, I didn't talk about powerful vessels. So powerful vessels are much like the one that we've just created. But basically, if they don't have a seat on a council, like we, we talked about earlier, we removed one uh, from Marshall, they're not going to be happy. So it's a good idea to keep your vessels in line. As you see, we have a major debuff um, on on this vessel so starting a sway scheme with him making sure your friends of him kind of increases your influence over him it's a good idea there are definitely perks as well you can get later in your trees that enable you to become friends with them or of course you could always look to uh, kill them off <laughs> if you want to um, but anyway let's fast forward one more time and we are actually going to start a quick war because there's one thing that I wanted to quickly um, talk about that I've seen a few people mention. So if we start a war, I know we can go to war with this guy right here. He's our nephew, but we do have a claim to his kingdom. Um, so we're kind of going to start war. There we go. And let's look here real quick. There we go. We can call our allies to war. So because we got more, because we made all of those alliances, we made a lot of alliances, um, hit the, the hints button when, when you do, and it will show you who you can actually call um, to help you because we were kind of similar in power. So having a little bit of extra backup is a good idea. Um, we can call a little bit of alliances. We can have one or two. There we go. It does cost us, however, um, in order to, you know, get these alliances and stuff it isn't free um sometimes you can use hooks to make it cheaper however and now something i want to talk about just because it didn't really show you in a tutorial but you can actually click on your rally point and you can move your rally point wherever you want so if you have a gigantic empire um your troops aren't having to cross the entire map in order to get to where you know you're trying to attack and so that's a good idea let's call these troops up and have them rally for us it takes them a little minute to kind of like gather from the realm now if we click on uh, the troops that we've made we can actually split it into two separate armies and this can become very useful later in the game because you know, each piece of land can only feed 
a certain amount of troops. As you see right here, it says supply line. The supply line is 4,160 currently. So if we have a lot more troops on this one piece of land, you know, it's only going to take a certain amount of time before we are all starving to death. Um, also, sometimes I think it would just be more beneficial to split up and attack two people at once. And if you just click here on the armies, you can individually pick them and have them do different things at once. But yeah, guys, I think that's it. I think I'm going to leave this video here. Um, there's a lot to talk about this game. And this was just you know, a starting guide, something to think about when you very first start loading up. Um, I'm going to be doing different videos, different uh, guides th for all the mechanics within this game. But I think a beginner's guide was kind of where um, I should really have started. If you guys have any tips and tricks that you've picked up in your time plan, please don't be afraid to drop that down in the comments. Um, it helps us grow as a community. I'm sure there's things that I've missed. I haven't even talked about dynasties yet. Um, but again, we're not even the head of our dynasty, so there's no point in really talking about that in this one. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to talk about that we could literally talk hours and hours and hours. Um, so if I've missed anything, pop that down in the comments. Also, we have an active and growing Discord. I'd love to get more Crusader Kings people in. The link for that will be down in the description. So feel free to join, talk about Crusader Kings, or we'll talk about any game you, that you might be playing. And uh, yeah, until next time, guys, I've been Amonk, we've been a Critical Eclipse, and I'll see you in the next video real soon. Until then, take it easy and happy gaming.